Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I am coming to you with my favorite books of 2022. I can't believe it's finally that time, and it is the last of my uh, year-end videos. This is always my hardest video to film, and in some years it's because I have a difficult time narrowing down all of the great books. I feel like there were a lot of great books and a lot of great standouts this year. But I feel like there's only a handful of them compared to years past where I have two or three books from different genres, different categories. To me, I'm just kind of all over the place this year. I do want to say if you didn't watch my most surprising books of 2022, I do recommend you watch that because a couple of the books that I do consider big favorites of the year I talked about there because they were just such genuine surprises to me. So in the interest of there not being a lot of overlap between that video and this one, I'm not going to talk about most of them here. One is going to make its appearance again. But let's go on and get into this. I don't think I have an even top 10 this year and I really am all over the place. I do have a top three, so I will save those to the last. Everything else I think can kind of fluctuate a little bit, so let's go on and get into it. The first book I want to talk about is one that I think technically I finished last year, but I was reading it at that cusp between December and January, and so I'm going to count it in this year because I had already posted my favorite books of the year when I picked this up, and that is Iron Widow by Sharon J. Zhao. This is a sci-fi fantasy, let's say, and it is a retelling of China's first female emperor. I went into this hopeful that I would like it, but I thought that maybe it was going to be overhyped. It seemed like nearly everyone had loved it and rated it five stars, and I just thought, is it really going to be that good? Yes, it is. I'll say that for the most part, kind of the sciencey aspects of it that went over my head a little bit and I sometimes had trouble picturing things. But the reason that this book gets five stars, the reason that this book is a favorite, is the characterization. I think it's absolutely insane, the characterization that is done here. And it is specifically true in the romance subplot. This book has gotten a lot of attention for featuring a polyamorous relationship. So rather than just your standard love triangle, everyone's ending up together. And I really love that. I personally love a love triangle, and I know a lot of people don't nowadays. Sorry, they're the best. I'm almost not interested in reading a book if it doesn't feature a love triangle, because I think love triangles, when they are utilized properly, are some of the best tools that an author has to kind of indicate character growth. I think this is specifically true for young adult, where maybe a character is trying to figure out their life path, what they want to do with their future. A love triangle can often indicate paths that a character might take by using two different characters for those love triangles. And so rather than just truly picking the person that you want to be with, you're also picking the path that your life and that the storyline is going to go down. And I really like love triangles because of that, but I always pick the person that they don't wind up with in a love triangle. What can I say? I'm always unlucky, uh, except in a couple of cases. So I was really excited that this was polyamorous, but I think the relationship still functioned the way that I want a good love triangle to function in that both of the characters who were initial options before it became polyamorous, they seemed like very different paths that our main character could take. And I really liked how the romance didn't make you choose between two really fantastic characters, but it also meant that our main character didn't necessarily have to choose one life path. Choosing one path doesn't necessarily mean that you've closed the door completely on the other. And so I really liked how the love story functioned on a romance level because boy, was I invested in this. I was so invested in this. I had a crush on everybody in this book. But then also it was so interesting in terms of what it meant for the characterization. This book was stunning. I truly can't believe this was a debut novel. I cannot. I cannot wait until the second book in this comes out. I'm going to reread it. I'm really excited. This is one that kind of snuck in on me at the end of last year, beginning of this year, and it meant that I kind of ended 2021 and started 2022 on a very big high, 
and it sent me pretty much into a very, very bad reading slump. This is utterly fantastic. We then have Dr. Faustus by Thomas Mann. Something that quite unintentionally colored 2022 for me was German classics, specifically modern German classics. I don't know who I am. I don't know what happened to me this year, but I picked up Thomas Mann's uh, Dr. Faustus for Faustathon this year. So I read a retelling of the Faust myth, and this is one that features a main character who is a musician, which I thought was genuinely fascinating to place into the myth of Faust. I loved this. I mean, really, I loved this. This was very romantic in tone, and the writing was absolutely gorgeous. I mean, that's why this is five stars for me. It was a very dense book, and I often found myself reading passages that were so beautiful, I had to sit the book down and walk away just to process what I had just read. I had to sit the book down occasionally, and I started tabbing it, but you can see that I gave up. It was just too much. It was too much to keep up with. This is a book that is not going to work very well for everybody, but I felt like it was the perfect storm of everything that I love in literature put together. This is one that is not only one of my tops of the year, but is a book I would say is one of my favorites of all time. And so that means that you have to know that my top three are really good because this is not in my top three. But this was just really stunning to me. I've heard a lot of people speak on Thomas Mann in the past, and I've been curious, but I always thought there would be something about him that wouldn't jive with me. But this was dreamy, it was whimsical, and it had so much to say around the conversation of art that I personally really enjoyed. I love when art is vaguely a plot line in a book. I love when art features in a story. And music is not something that I would say I'm all that familiar with. It's not something I would say I understand. But I walked away from this book feeling like I understood it, and I certainly felt like I understood the main character. This was really, really beautiful, and it was really rewarding. I just think it was a big endeavor. I struggle to recommend it because it took a lot out of me to read this, but oh my gosh, it was stunning. Let's talk about Caraval by Stephanie Garber. And not technically Caraval. I think all three books in the Caraval trilogy could be here, let's be honest. But I'm going to say the second book in the trilogy, Legendary, is my favorite. Caraval got a lot of hype here on BookTube when it was published, which was around five years ago. And I read it along with everybody else, and it seems like I didn't think it was all that special. And in truth, Caraval, the first book in this trilogy, it's nothing new. It's treading old ground. But there is something about this world, and there is something about Stephanie Garber's writing. And I think the second book really amps it up and really moves into a new world. And that really made this series stand out to me. The second book opened things up and really opened up the magic system in such an interesting way. These books are some of the coziest that you will read. The romance in them is so wonderful. Oh my gosh, it's so wonderful. But the world itself is so rich and easy to visualize. You can just easily see everything that she describes to you. And you get so attached to the characters. That's one of the things that really stands out to me about this that doesn't stand out to me about a lot of other books on my list this year other than Iron Widow. I think a lot of times this year I placed good prose and great writing. I placed that above characterization in terms of enjoyment. That's not normally how I rate books and that's not normally how favorite books of mine are born. And so to me, this series stands out as something that I loved truly because of the characters, not because of the prose, and really not even because of the world. I was in this because I loved the characters. I think most everything else on my list, I really loved the writing of or the concept behind. But this is one where I really felt attached to the characters. And when I finished this trilogy, I was just depressed. I was really depressed. And Iron Widow was the same way. Stephanie Garber is one of the delights to me of the year. She's possibly my favorite discovery of the past couple of years in terms of authors. I really love the way that she writes and I love the way that she constructs stories. So I'm really excited to see what else comes from her. But truly legendary, I think, is the strongest of the trilogy. And so it's the one that I really wanted to talk about. But this series is just very cozy and it's really wormed its way into my heart. I think about it all the time.
Something that I would never have thought I was going to put on this list is a book that I finished in the past month. I always struggle with that, putting a book in my favorites of the year when I've just read it in the past month because I don't feel like my feelings have had time to settle. But this one is one I feel like I have to talk about. I feel like it is definitely a favorite of the year just in terms of the enjoyment that I had while reading it. And that is The Santa Claus Murder. This is a cozy mystery from the golden age of detective fiction, and it is set at Christmas when uh, the patriarch of a family is found murdered by someone who is dressed as Santa Claus. What I personally really loved about this was the format of the book because it was set up in such a way that we got a perspective from essentially every character in the house before the detective came in. And so we were able to get into the characters' heads before we looked at them through the clinical perspective of law enforcement, which I really liked and I thought gave this a very personal quality for a mystery, especially a mystery written during this time period. I read or attempted to read four Christmas mysteries this year, and this was far and away my favorite. I thought the writing of this was so charming, and it really did feel cozy to me. I've never been someone who thought that I could get into a cozy mystery, but 100% I can if it's written like this. There were a lot of characters here, there were a lot of names, there was a lot to keep up with, but I think the format of the book was so smart that it allowed us to feel like we knew everybody. I was never once confused when people were talking, when people were making reference to other family members. I felt like I knew who everyone was and I felt that their personalities were really distinct. It's very hard for me to say that I would rate a mystery book five stars. I feel like there has to be something really special there because I don't tend to reread mysteries once you found out what's going on. To me, there's really no reason to revisit it. But in this case, I can see myself coming back to this time and time again. I can see this becoming kind of a Christmas tradition. Mavis Doriel Hay, the author of this, is also one of my favorite discoveries of the year, and I will definitely be reading more from her. I know I said I wasn't going to overlap with my most surprising reads here, so I'll keep this short. But something that I mentioned on my most surprising reads of the year is one of my favorites of all time, I mean truly, and that's Varney the Vampire. <laughs> this is a Penny Dreadful that was written during the Victorian period about a guy who was a vampire who moves in next door to a family, and you find out that there are some ulterior motives there. The family is so funny. The relationship that the family forms with the vampire is also really funny, but I think what makes this a favorite for me is the writing, and I think also the characterization. I was really invested in this in a way that I haven't found myself invested in many classics this year. It's been a very dry year for me in terms of classics, and I haven't felt like I got really invested in many of them. This is one of the few, and that is something to say because this book clocks in at 1,800, 1,900 pages, and I was fully engaged and obsessed with it from page one. As always with my top books of the year, this is really a personal list and I often place books on this list that I know are not really going to work for everybody else. And Varney is one of the ones on my list this year that I think is probably a hard sell for most people just in terms of its length. And there are also just oddities about the storytelling by dint of it being a penny dreadful that I think will irritate a lot of readers. But I am obviously the intended audience for Varney. It was dark. It was romantic. It was gorgeously written, and it was about a vampire. I mean, at heart, I'm still basic. I still am who I am, and I just love vampire stories. But I think truly, this is probably my second favorite vampire story that I have ever read. And I know that that's very high praise, but I, I can't believe that more people aren't talking about this. I can't believe this isn't being studied. There's something very special here to me, and it's very diamond in the rough but it is just so unique to this particular story and to these characters. There was really something here, and it was certainly something that just hit me like a lightning strike. I knew in the first chapter that I was going to be into this, but I didn't know that I was going to be into it for the full 2,000 pages, but I was. This is one of my favorites of the year, but it's also become one of my favorites of all time. Let's talk about The Cloisters by Katie Hayes. This is one that I think is going to be pretty contentious for a lot of people because I have seen very mixed reviews of this. And a lot of them talk about the fact that this book has very 
poor characterization. And I recognize that and I do think it's true. This is a dark academia story that is set in the Cloisters, which is a branch of the Met in New York. And it is about tarot and medievalism, basically. And this is really a great example of my theme that I was rating books five stars this year, choosing favorite books this year based on the concept and based on the writing style rather than on the plot or on the characterization. Because I will agree with a lot of the negative reviews that I've seen that the characterization is not the greatest here. But it has so much going for it in terms of its conversations about academia that I really thought the book was a very accurate portrayal of a specific type of academia, the academia of the archive and of the library, which I don't often see reflected or discussed in a lot of dark academia works. So to me, this was really refreshing. And I also thought it was very authentic to the real experience of being in an archive, being in a library. I also just really loved how it played with medieval ideals, how it played with the occult. Uh, this is very thematically similar to The Secret History. And I think if you loved The Secret History, then you should pick this up. I don't think the prose is on the same level, but I think it really wants to discuss the same topics in the same type of way. And I really enjoyed the discussions both in the secret history and in the cloisters for how they were presented and how accurate I truly believe them to be, how exclusive knowledge can be. This felt very true to my lived experience in academia. And so I think my relationship to this book is very personal because I just think Katie Hayes, the author, gets it. If you asked me next year if this was still a favorite, I would be curious to know what my answer would be. I'm not sure if this one has long legs, if it has longevity, if I will always call it a favorite book or a favorite book of dark academia at least, but it's definitely a favorite book of the year for me right now. And then we have Belladonna, which completely took me by storm. This is by Adeline Grace, who I have read before, and I'll say, I didn't really like. And so this was me kind of giving her as an author a second chance. And boy, I am so glad that I did. This is kind of a fantasy romance that is essentially Death and the Maiden. I love it. I live for it. Uh, but it's also in some ways a mystery novel, which I think gave this a very unique tone. And I really loved the world here. This felt very Victorian in vibe. So I just really enjoyed exploring the world. I loved the characters. I loved the plot. The romance was so strong here. I was so invested in it. This one was just a feast for me in terms of tropes that I really love. This really had it all for me. And it was a lesson to me that you should always give an author a second chance because they can always come through and surprise you. They can always give you a five-star book. And that is definitely the case here. Belladonna is a really interesting novel because on the surface, you know, it's a fun fantasy romp. It's a fun fantasy novel. It's a romance. It's a mystery. But underneath, I really thought the book was playing with some really interesting ideas in terms of death and the relation of wealth that people have. I really enjoyed its discussions of class and I thought it was true to kind of the Victorian period. I was reading this during Victober so I was really comparing this a lot with Victorian classics and I just thought that the themes were so interesting and understated in this book. Uh, this is definitely one of my favorites of the year and I am really looking forward to the second book in this series. Normally I read a book and I wish it was a standalone but I was reading this and throughout the book, I kept thinking, please make this a series. Please make this a series because I want to read more in this world. And so I'm really glad that it's going to be a series. Let's get into my top three. We are finally there. In my third spot, we have Tender is the Flesh, which is a dystopian uh, about a world in which animals have caught a virus so uh, we can no longer consume animals as meat. And so a new meat industry has come up in which we consume other people. This book is one that I read because it was recommended by a K-pop idol, Kevin, from The Boys. And I really felt like I was going out on a limb here. I felt like I really was not going to like this and that it was going to be very gruesome. And most certainly the book is gruesome. But it is so dynamic and so well written. 
I really loved the social commentary here. This is not nearly as discreet in its discussion of topics as some of the other books on this list are. They are really discussing this on the page. It's very much a conversation about how people can be treated as animals and how animals should sometimes be treated as people. And I really thought this was just utterly fascinating. I loved the conversations that it was having and it did it in such an interesting way. Uh, I really thought it was a great critique of our current meat industry, but I also really enjoyed its critique of politics and statesmanship because one of the conversations that this book has is whether this virus that affected animals is something constructed by the government to impose kind of control on the population, let's say. And I thought that was so interesting in and of itself. I haven't read a dystopia that I truly loved in a very long time. And when I say that, I haven't read a dystopia that I felt was making a true social commentary in a very long time. And this one definitely was. It did it with nuance and it did it with grace. I think this is a very hard book to read and it's not going to work for everybody because it's certainly gross. They go into excruciating detail about meat plants. But I think it's a very important read and I really, really would love to study this in class. I wish I was back in college just to read this book and write an essay on it because this book has everything. Truly, it does. This was a really fascinating one. It took me completely by surprise, and I am so glad that I picked it up. My second favorite book of the year is Booth by Karen Joy Fowler, which is a historical fiction about the Booth family. And the most famous member of the Booth family is John Wilkes Booth. He assassinated President Abraham Lincoln in 1865. But this book is not really about him. It's about his family, who are a family of Shakespearean actors. I cannot describe to you how brilliant this book is. I truly can't. Words don't even come to mind for how good this book was. I really sat there every night finishing a chapter, mind blown, wishing that I had annotated it. It was stunning to me. I learned quite a bit from this actually because I never knew very much about the Booth family. And the big things that you do know about the Booths are footnotes in this book. And I think that was the brilliance of it. I think that might be a point of contention or a point of disappointment for a lot of people that they wish maybe the assassination of Lincoln was talked about more uh, or that one of the Booths saved Lincoln's son. I think you might wish that that was talked about more. That's very interesting, an interesting coincidence in history. But that's not the point of this book. Lincoln is talked about in alternating chapters, but this is about the Booth family, and it's not really about John Wilkes at all. I really enjoyed living with this family during the time that I was reading this. It truly felt like I was there, and it felt like we got to know each of them so well. There were a few speculative elements to this and the way it was written, which went hand in hand with the Shakespearean dramatic quality of the writing and of their relationship to each other as a family that made it feel like you were watching King Lear or something like that. This book was so special. I hope it has won awards. I really do. If I could give it every award, I would. Karen Joy Fowler, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for giving us this. Thank you so much for publishing this, truly, because this is one of my new favorites of all time. I was blown away by this book, and I think about it frequently. I think about scenes, specifically with one of the Booth daughters, that was just so moving to me. There was something to this language, and I think it was that Karen Joy Fowler really wanted to play up the Shakespearean element and kind of the theatrical element that this family was a family of actors and thus that's how they acted around each other that I think made this feel very unique and I think lent the writing such a magical fairy tale quality. Truly this was just one of the best books that I've ever read. Truly magical. I know I've said that a lot but this this really was spellbinding. Though again I do feel like it's probably a book that some people are going to struggle with, but it really worked well for me personally. And it's not only one of my favorites of the year, it's a favorite of all time. Here we go, my favorite book of the year. I think you all know what it is. It's Demian by Herman Hesse. Once again, a book I picked up 
because K-pop idols recommended it. BTS recommended this book and in fact based an entire album and music video around it. And I went into this thinking I would probably hate it because I don't really like things that were written post-World War I, immediately post-World War I. I thought this would be philosophical. I thought it would be dense. I thought it wouldn't have great characterization. And you know what? Maybe all of those things are true. Is the characterization the greatest? I think it is. Is it dense? I think it can be. Uh, is it philosophical? Most definitely. And all of those things mean this is a five-star book. This is one of the most gorgeously written books I have ever had the pleasure of reading. One of my favorite quotes I highlighted this whole book. He says, I believe I have been on my way all my life long, but now I have come home. She smiled in a motherly way. One never comes home, she said gently, but where friendly roads converge, the whole world looks for an hour like home. This book felt like home to me. I just wanted to take root in this and live there. I cannot tell you enough how much I just felt like privileged to have the opportunity to read this. I truly cannot believe that here in the States, we do read a Herman Hesse in school. I believe we read uh, Siddhartha. Why? Why? When this book was there? When this book was there? Why? This book is an introspective look into kind of the descent into darkness and into sin and kind of also your progression from childhood to adulthood and how that often means losing your innocence and maybe becoming less of a good person. And I thought it was so brilliant in its discussions of religion, personality, and there was just this theme of music that underlay everything in this book. It was just one of the most magnificent pieces of literature I've ever read. And I mean that truly. I am not saying it with hyperbole. Sometimes you read the right book at the right time. And this was there for me. This is easily one of my favorite books of all time. And in fact, it might actually be my favorite book of all time after Interview with a Vampire. I really do think about it all the time. And I think about quotes in it all the time. I mean, I highlighted this on every page. Every page I had something to say. I wanted to note something. It was just really, really brilliant. It felt like I was sitting down to a lecture and Herman Hesse was gonna teach me the ways of life. And I think this would have been particularly hard hitting for me at that cusp between teenager and adult. I think this really would have hit me very hard at 17, 18 years old. And I think that's the point of the book. I think there is an entire generation of people that this book was trying to speak to. And it's the generation that came of age in World War I. And so there is a darkness to this and a melancholy to this that I think is present because of the war. But there is also just a level of hopefulness and beauty to it. It was raw. It was emotional. I don't know. This is another one that I just think words don't do justice. This is one of my favorite books I've ever read. And I am thankful to BTS that they uh, based a music video around this and I read it because of that. So thanks to them for recommending this. Wow, what a banger. And what a way to essentially start the year. I think I read this in February and I knew then it would be my favorite book of the year and it most definitely was. This has been a pretty interesting reading year for me, and I feel like my list today really reflects that. I would love to know down below if you have read any of these books, but I really want to know your favorites this year. Tell me all of your favorite books this year. I would love to know that down in the comments, but that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.